Hello, my name is Michael O'Keefe, a.k.a. The Movie Mystic. If you enjoy these film reviews, then please press the like button, subscribe, hit the bell, and stay in the know. Subscribing to this channel means you get to, to, to watch the coolest new film industry interviews. Here's some groovy film reviews, and get some live streams, too. Number 34. The movie Compulsus is a vigilante movie broadly like Dirty Harry, but specifically like Miss 45 or Thriller. It belongs in the rape revenge subgenre. Despite us not getting a graphic rape scene, the vigilante uh, justice deals with sexual harassment. The female characters who we hang out with are bisexual or lesbian who are uh, split on our lead who's beating up sexual harassers to be generous. They're usually rapists, and I believe uh, audiences will be split on this movie too. It doesn't seem to condemn vigilante justice. It does a little bit more... Th- that just presented, yes, uh, there are key characters who play devil's advocate, but the ending is some sort of call to action within the storyline. I love movies like Miss 45 and Thriller, though, so nothing here is presented that I am against within the confines of a movie. Here's just hoping things don't spill into violence in the streets, which I highly doubt will happen, but I know this flick will rub some people the wrong way. The poem recited, which calls for action, is incredibly strong. I felt The hairs on my arms stand up in a positive way. This movie has some real grit to it. While there's no Miss 45, it is still worth putting it on as a double bill. Number 33. I must confess something. I blocked Bump for the 2021 edition of of Fantasia Fest, or had a role in doing so. I think. It's been over a year, but I do in fact believe that I saw this as a submitted short and wrote a negative review. Seeing it a year later in front of Mickey Reese's Country Gold, I think that perhaps I was too harsh on it because the audience was laughing. It shows a guy getting bumped into on a Toronto street. A heimless confrontation is captured from across the street in a single shot that lasts three minutes. And so I think my initial critique of filmmaking technique from the lack of cuts to humor I wasn't warming up to that particular day was misplaced. So perhaps it is an incredible technique. But it is still funny stuff, and ultimately the audience is the judge, so I walk it back. Bump should have been included during Fantasia Fest 2021. My bad. Number 32. I watched the horror movie Hypochondriac at Fantasia Fest, having strategically seated myself next to script writer C. Robert Cargill, who notably wrote the Sinister movies, then he did Doctor Strange, and now he has the black phone to his name. So this guy knows horror movies. Of course, I wanted to get some insights into the industry as well as talk about myself to such an esteemed audience. But when the movie was finished, I asked the successful horror scriptwriter, did you think that was a good horror movie? He paused and said, I have to think about it, which is a very diplomatic thing to say. Have we thought about it? I don't think the movie is ultimately a top tier movie, but I still saw filmmaking showing off a promising career for writer-director Addison Heyman, who will hopefully continue this style of filmmaking. The movie is a reinterpretation of his real-life mental breakdown dealing with his bipolar mother during the Q&A. I asked if he ultimately loves his mother, which he does, I'm glad, because he made an entire movie about her. I asked Greg Cicero, the author of The Disaster Artist, which is a book that documents his time working with Tommy Wiseau, the same question about Tommy, and he too said the same thing. It's a hard, but to me, crucial question. I felt that the movie is a little self-important about the relationship, though, and maybe a lot of distance on the topic. The movie is raw, but unrefined for a movie-watching experience to me. The anecdote didn't entirely make its way into a quality horror movie. Number 31. I have been a big fan of Rebecca McKendry over the years for her terrific podcasting. To be honest, she reminds me of a mentor of mine from years ago, and without naming names, I wish this person had some of Rebecca's insights. Her thoughts on current and old genre films always have nuance as well as pizzazz, ensuring that her podcasts always pop, without the mention besides through pop being a distraction for the substance of her taste. Anyways, all that is positive context is is for the fact that I was not taking her Fantasia Fest movie, which is coming to Shutter in August. It's called Glorious, and it takes place in a single setting of a washroom at a pit stop somewhere rural. Our lead West, played by Ryan Quantan, irked me in a bad way. I wasn't liking the acting here. The character is a little too whiny for my liking, and I get it. He is trapped in a washroom with a celestial creature voiced by J.K. Simmons, who is an omnipotent gooey blob. Also, the reveal of who Wes is in the end didn't work for me, although it didn't contradict any information we had in uh, the story. It was done in a way which annoyed me. I think it was done a little too late in the story. The movie is slick, but it didn't work for me, which is why I'm giving it a three and a half stars out of five. If it didn't have J.K. Simmons or the visual effects, it would certainly be lower. It was a thrill to see Rebecca introduce her movie. I just wish I liked it more. Number 30. While watching All Jacked Up and Full of Worms, I went on a roller coaster ride of enjoyments. I started by not liking it. I started to warm up to it. 
Then the ending seemed lame to me, and that sums up the experience. It follows a group of, let's just call them eccentric characters on a spectrum living at first separately from each other. Then they interact with one another, and uh, we get what we get. They all notably have a very strange dialect. I didn't like the rhythm of the way they, or they were saying these weird things at first. Then certain lines and topics are revisited, and at this point, it became fun as well as charming, making it kind of a slow burn of strangeness. The idea of telling a story about psychedelic drugs and people getting high off eating or stoning worms is funny. So overall, the movie worked for me, despite my feeling that it was an uneven experience. My biggest gripe was the ending, which makes it an anti-drug movie. So I know I must place it in Reefer Madness or Disco Godfather territory, as that violates the cinematic principle to me, which is potentially judging the audience. I don't want any movie to be an anti-drug movie like that. Drug use will set off different things in different minds. So to me, it is inappropriate for a movie to tell the audience about how to live. The movie played here in Canada, after all, the land of legal weed. Number 29. Where the Witch Lives is a creepy little project. It's a short film, to be sure, but a funky mystical thing that makes me call it little when I'm trying to endear and contextualize it as something cool made by a director I have now interviewed twice. Marielle Sharp is attracted to the offbeat and wild sort of things. She likes different perspectives that when you understand them are not controversial at all for their own sake, but simply, in this case, an understandable role reversal. She told me that Where the Witches Lives is about showing the view of a child being afraid of their parents for legitimate reasons. Instead of making a movie about the anxiety of bringing up a child, the, this perspective is still legitimate. There's some gentle spookiness in the short film with lots of great acting and emotions here. You should enjoy watching it, and perhaps it will be developed into a feature-length film, and then perhaps it will play at a future Fantasia Fest. Number 28. The movie Stellar and Magical Ride is a gangster road trip comedy flick that had its ups as well as downs. I basically think it's a decent movie that doesn't make me feel too negative or too positive about the experience. The gangster himself is deconstructed in a way that I didn't feel was necessary late into the movie. We learn why he is the way he is in an unnecessary flashback, giving too much exposition and violating the cinematic rule of show me, don't tell me. I also don't think we need to be ethically behind him. Uh, as his former boss and villain in the story is the ruthless one. Our protagonist is clearly a likable guy in a bad situation, but we get some slap sex humor here, which I am a fan of. It has a nice pace to it. Japanese movies can be funny, so this one brings the jokes. It's just a bit of an uneven experience with, the, with its dramatic relief that I felt ultimately hurt the experience of an otherwise pretty fun experience, which left me a little disengaged. Number 27. I loved watching The Cop, The Gangster, The Devil during Fantasia Fest 2019 that started Ma Dong Siok, who would go on to be in last year's MCU movie, The Eternals. So I clicked on the YouTube trailer for the roundup. A dumb smile was on my face. During my walk back home after seeing the roundup, I realized there's a noticeable formula in both movies, which plays on both the inherent intimidation, humor, and limitations of Ma, uh, Ma De Dong Siok's enormous body. When we see that body... We know he will crush, and the blows he gives got huge applause from the, both Fantasia audiences. This isn't unforgiven here. There is no contemplation on the nature of violence. It's just fun stuff. Ma, also in both movies, has an antagonist who outmaneuvers him through deceit and intellects. So the issue becomes dodging Ma for this character because we know nobody has a chance up against him. What made his character more interesting in The Cop, The Gaster, The Devil is that he was the bad guy fighting the worst guy. And in the roundup, there is an extreme amount of jingoism for a cop. A part of me wanted to forget about that and enjoy the movie, but it becomes an issue given our contemporary dilemma with policing. Seeing Ma using excessive force as a cop in interrogation and arresting felons with no sense of a moral dilemma is a problem. It doesn't disqualify the film for me as entertainment, because it is very funny throughout. But it will certainly trigger people in the audience, since I found it unlayered in this regard. It could have had 2.5 dimensions. Number 26. When I heard of the movie Magritte starring Gerard Depardieu was coming to Fantasia Fest, it was exciting to me. Uh, it looks like a throwback to great French 50s crime movies like, like Bob Le Flambeur or Touche Pas au Grisby. The idea of an old school French crime aesthetic found in a new movie was very appealing to me, but this movie violated the ultimate cinema cinema to any film goer. It was boring. I simply felt this murder mystery was not intriguing, gripping, or appealing in any way I can think it should be. So it was simply a snooze fest for me that I patiently waited to end, even though I knew it wouldn't course correct. Gerard de Bordeaux used to be so handsome and has acted in some excellent films. It's just that this isn't one of them. I always found French car movies from the 50s to be very refreshing with their Gallic perspective on a familiar genre. This movie doesn't sully those movies. It simply does not meet their expectations. I can see Jean-Pierre Melville shaking his head in his grave. It's certainly 
uh, current French director and Fontaine wouldn't have made such a lousy flick. Number 25. Try to watch the short film Pretty Pickle if you like kinky comedies that are horror adjacent. You just might, must see it to get it. I enjoyed watching the shorts so much that I even watched it twice, which is rare for me with shorts. I got to meet the director of the short in Montreal for Fantasia Fest, and I was rooting for him before watching the short. But the result speaks for itself. You laugh, feel, then gasp while watching this one. It's about a couple with some kingfetcher that is only partially expected. It does throw you off in a good way. It develops and manages to tell a story with its conceits at the end, which is cool. So if you like black and white photography, as well as kink, as well as horror movies, or even experimental movies, there is a solid chance that you'll be entertained by Pretty Pickle, and I suggest watching The Devil's Honey afterwards. Number 24. Pop Right is by director Shin Ishiro Uede, who made the hilarious one cut of the dead back in 2017, where he distinguished himself in Japan as a director who could make a hysterical movie about show business. While One Cut of the Dead focused on the Japanese film industry, Pop Rain looks at the world of big business and manga, Japanese comic books, with a concept that made me burst out loud laughing when I learned about it in a live stream. I did about some announced Fantasia Fest movies. Our sleazy Max Ren-like protagonist is, is a player in manga, but relies on acquiring existing successes instead of taking chances to earn his fortune. He's basically a smart businessman and lousy for upcoming artists. Then one day, he wakes up to not find his genitals and must go on a personal odyssey to reclaim his sack or live quite an unfortunate life. He learns through a group meeting with men afflicted with the same issue that his genitals haven't left them, but retreated inside his body. So these men mu must face the issue uh, of whatever causes traumatic incident. The movie loses steam, though. It could have been a lot funnier throughout. I wish there was more of this hilariousness sprinkled throughout the more dramatic second half of the movie. So it's a hysterical concept and first half of a movie. Number 23. I enjoyed the movie Legendary in Action because I love Hong Kong cinema. And a movie about making that kind of action cinema to me was personally gratifying, especially since the movie within the movie is sort of a Shaw Brothers style homage. The story looks at a director who's going through a crisis. His early career was promising, but then he started to lack motivation to make great content, and his dip in quality leads to hard times. He's trying to get his career back by making a movie starring his childhood kung fu lead, who is now an old man who is quite judgmental and argumentative. Frankly, he is a crustier version of where the director might be in a couple of decades. There was a lot of yelling in this movie. It's like a midlife crisis story that didn't always work for me. But I was still engaged throughout two-thirds of the film, approximately, which is pretty good, to be honest. That said, I'll be hitting 40 in just over five years, so maybe it was more relatable than I am comfortable to admit. And the fact that there is an appreciation for classic Hong Kong cinema put a smile on my face. There are plenty of Hollywood movies about Hollywood, so it's neat to see a Hong Kong movie about Hong Kong movies. In the movie, they claim it is an industry that is up in the air, which would be truly a devastating loss. Number 22. I thoroughly enjoyed the South Korean movie from this year, The Killer, which is not to be confused with John Woo's 1989 masterpiece with the same name, which is in my in my top 10 movies of all time, to be certain. The new South Korean movie may not be a masterpiece, but like the John Woo film, it has scene upon scene of glorious, gory violence, added with some solid emotional perspective underpinning the scenes of mayhem. When a killer has a code or purpose behind what seems like senseless violence, then things work for us better as a viewer. This movie is mass entertainment, and not the vision of an odd sewer. But it really is a lot of fun. It starts with a bane and ends with a bane in the form of a whimper. Everyone is beautiful here. And at the same time, you can see why they deserve to die at any second by the movie logic presented here. It's a sugar-coated assassin movie. Honestly, I was going to write it off as, as disposable early into the viewing, but eventually I realized the movie is quite good for what it is, and I shouldn't overanalyze myself if I happen to enjoy something that doesn't take itself seriously. It's a fun movie for the summer. Number 21. While not as accomplished of a movie as Gimme Pity, the previous Amanda Kramer creation, Please Give Me Please, is a solid stepping stone towards that greatness she would achieve and has interesting things displayed. It was quite a Fantasia Fest double build to witness. I certainly have nothing in my prolific movie watching history to compare it to, but Please Give Me Please to me is clearly a notch beneath Gimme Pity because it seems coherent and conventional by comparison. It is a 1950s movie uh, love letter to movies such as Sitting in the Rain, To the Wild One, and I'm sure lots of other things. There are musical numbers, beat neck poets, and a guy and, and a gang who wears the mandatory leather jackets. There's some gender fluidity on display. You know it's a 2022 movie, as the topic might not have might have been smuggled in through suggestion in the 1950s, but never openly explored in that socially conservative time. The performances are certainly strange, and it works well as the movie you watch directly after 
give me pity because this is the time you'll be most sympathetic to this movie that is perhaps a little dull. Pastiche art, genre love letters, tribute movies, or whatever you want to call them, uh, can always be called self-indulgent or uninteresting simply because what someone likes does not necessarily translate into an interesting story. And that is how I lightly felt for this movie. Number 20. I enjoyed Out of the Rain, one reason being for how specific it is, which allows for a real digestion to occur to get across its point of view while watching the entertaining documentary that is just under two hours. It's all about open members of the LGBTQ plus community in wrestling. One of the amusing points is the wrestling entrances are quite like drag, like drag show strutting, a parallel you won't be able to get out of your head. There are various open LGBTQ plus wrestlers who share their story in the documentary and even talk about their various leagues, which are all relatively new, yet you will walk away full of awareness of most of them. It starts off through the history of the LGBTQ plus within re- professional wrestling, as well as the WWE's policies today, uh, which is quite juicy politics that any viewer should appreciate learning about here. We are getting better as a society in accepting the LGBTQ+, but we are far from being entirely tolerant, so this documentary is also an occult action in its spreading of awareness. How we talk about all performers is now under scrutiny. For me, it was interesting history. An interesting parallel emerged, and now I know about co- the contemporary LGBTQ+, wrestling scene, which seems like quite a lot of fun. Number 19. Now, Sissy is a movie I can really get behind. This movie looks at a popular yet just scraping by influencer who could reconnect with her childhood best friend and reconnect with devastating consequences. We learn about their past gradually. I like the dramatic drip as well as the second half of the movie very much. While the first part is the necessary setup that I believe pays off very nicely by the end credits. My favorite thing about Sissy is the score. It gives us a feeling of Hollywood in the 1930s or 40s vibe, where everything is supposed to be utopic yet simmering closely underneath our negative thoughts and actions. My second favorite thing is the violence. It's a lot of fun. I don't even want to describe the context of it beyond it be dramatically satisfying, but also good genre goods that will make you feel, let's just say, a lot. It also does work as a comment on influencer culture, where the people we follow seem to have it all figured uh, out, yet we know... That cannot be quite possible by the way it is in our heads versus lived experience, which is which traumatizes all of us. It doesn't work perfectly. I found some of the actors to be obnoxious, but it's a strong concept of a movie, and the result is very good. Hopefully, this will attract new genre cinema goers. Number 18. When I first saw that Fantasia Fest had a movie called Swallowed, I thought perhaps it was a, some sort of bizarre sequel to the horrific drama Swallow, which played at Fantasia in 2019, but thankfully it was not. It is a very good gangster movie, which which ratchets up tension nicely and has a terrific role for Mark Patton of A Nightmare on Elm Street, Elm Street Part 2 fame, who is on a comeback tour with this, but also the documentary Scream Queen by Nightmare on Elm Street. It has four principal cast members who are all having a very bad day. Someone is leaving town to go to, to do porn in L.A., uh, but not before his friend goes on a consequential drug smuggling trip that gets forcibly worse thanks to two gangsters. What's fun about this movie is how things progressively get worse and gross. It seems relentless, but within the confines of, of a short runtime, you are kept from having a total panic attack from everything on the screen. The two young men must swallow some small packages that they only agreed to do at gunpoint and are not even told what they are. It, what it is they are putting into their bodies to poop out at a later point, but eventually we learn that they are bugs. These bugs are then melted down to use on joints, the gangsters are notably brutal in the process, but thankfully within the intensity of everything, absurdist humor spreads out nicely, making it a bumpy but fun ride of a movie. Number 17. I love discovering Space Monster Wanwagui at the Fantasia Fest. To see a print projected of a South Korean kaiju movie that I never heard of before was a nice send-off for me. It was the last movie I saw before heading back home. Kaiju movies are awesome. Fans of them know they are silly, but defend them because they are entertaining, not necessarily because they're the most profound sort of movies that have been developed in cinema's history. Never have I seen a kaiju projected on film, nor have I seen one from South Korea. So the event was special, and this movie is silly. The plot has to do with aliens sending down a kaiju to see what Earthlings are made of. Thankfully, mankind rises to the occasion. Nothing we haven't seen before, to be sure, and the challenge I have found while watching the kaiju is the human being parts where special effects can't be relied upon. In this case, it is dumb, even by the genre, this genre standards. We see these two street guys freak out about the kaiju. They flail around a lot, panicking. Some stoicism would have been preferred by me at some point in that storyline, 
But there is a street kid who really stands up to the kaiju. He does so by jumping into the kaiju itself. At this point, the story picks up. Then the military take care of it in the end. The aliens know they can't conquer Earth, so they split. It was basically South Koreans making a Japanese-style movie. Even though my eyes rolled a lot, I can't deny the experience was fun. Number 16. I love the movie Jinpo, which I saw on the big screen during TIFF 2018, then would revisit to write a review of it during uh, the New York Asian Film Festival 2019. So it was a blast to find out that the star of that movie has another film festival movie. One in four is The Hateful Eight for 2022, but traded post-Civil War hurt feelings for the brewing tension and the slow burn uh, Western horror and gets some Tibetan mysticism within a basic setting that still packs a punch. It's no Tarantino movie, nor is it as good as Jimpa. The slow burn element of it works, though. While the first half was sort of dull by itself, it cohesively serves the plot for the gut punches we get in the showdown in the end. I like movies from Tibet because they lack polish. They show authentic people in a less developed part of the world that looks like it is in some ways a lifestyle from the pre-industrial age around 200 years ago. The movie is a fancy hat trick on a small budget that works because it's setting in real locals that make things pop. When a donkey opens the door to see the bloodshed, it gives a perplexed look that is totally unforgettable. I don't adore this movie, but I might have if I hadn't been spoiled by seeing Jinpun first. But the actor returns in a totally worthy Tibetan movie that you need to see, especially if you miss out on Jinpo, which plenty of people did. Number 15. It was fun to see Aaron Moorhead act in this very funny short film before the J.K. Simmons movie Glorious. So, in a way, Aaron was like the celebrity warm-up appearance before the main events and a clever programming stroke. The short is called Black Hole. Aaron recently made Moon Knight, though, and in 2019, he came out with his creative partner, partner Justin Benson to my channel Airbnb to be interviewed about his Anthony Mackie movies in Chronic, so I am familiar with his face. Despite that familiarity and the fact that throughout watching this sort of I was telling myself that this must be him, I needed to see his name on the end credits to fully believe my substantiated hunch. I believe it or not. Perhaps that is a testament to his acting chops and me being transported into this funny short about a black hole in his character's apartment that is a vortex to another dimension. Many inanimate objects go there but consequential things do too. It had everyone laughing, and I will label it as quality short filmmaking. Number 14. Muddy Robot 5 has the crowning achievement of being my favorite short film of Fantasia Fest this year. While I didn't see all that many of them in 2022, I did review a bunch in 2021 for the festival, which was a revelation of behind-the-scenes activity for this wonderful film festival. This movie is a comedic Filipino kaiju movie, but it takes the guise of a reality TV show of being in a team of humans who go into a Power Ranger-style giant robots to fight a kaiju that threaten the country. It is also 20 minutes plus, making it the length of a potential TV show. I'm not saying I would watch every episode, but I think it would be a very cool thing to be developed because we all laughed a lot watching this in the Fantasia Fest audience. The bickering personalities are all reality TV show archetypes where the show really shines. There is minimal kaiju activity here. It is all about the prima donnas who want to take credit for jumping into the robot suit to beat it up. In the first scene, though, the Money Robot 5 gets killed by the Kaiju, though, so there are stakes. As we can see, the, this next group are ridiculous, vapid, and stupid. So the crew known as Money Robot 5 2 do have dramatic stakes here. I think that this is the show we need, but maybe we don't deserve. I don't know if this was intended to be a pilot. I'm not sure it would succeed. I just want to see more of this hilarity in the future, to be honest. Number 13. I really enjoyed Honeycomb because it lacks the polish that most festival movies have, allowing its harshness to settle into me as a viewer in a more unique way that could have been accidental, but still just works. It seems more disturbing that the acting is amateur, it's just like how in a Dario Argento movie, the dialogue sounds like it was written for a child, which to me reminds me of how people talk like in my barely remembered dreams. The scenery from British Columbia is beautiful, and because it is littered with this Lord of the Flies storyline, that the open spaces on land and water become more unsettling. It's also a relief that it doesn't rely on the woods. There's quite despicable behavior on display that works again because of its lo-fi quality. It's just like how people will prefer a YouTube live stream of a voice that they appreciate covering the news over cable news. The call like organization of the girls shows that the female sex does have a more vicious politics, and I like the amount of, t- of time we get for the boys. It's not too little, but it doesn't dominate, so the talk about the boys can ultimately play a larger role. The mean girl attitude, though, does strike true, and it works for me even more because the line delivery isn't the best. It actually takes on another kind of quality that may or may not have been calculated, but worked for me. Number 12. 
I was down to see Orchestrator of Storms, the fantastic world of Jean Roland, not because I'm familiar with the inter- interesting career of Jean Roland, but because I'm familiar with the work of Kat Ellinger. If Kat says it's interesting, it probably is. She's do- been doing great work on Blu-rays for years. So, of course, I was going to watch her directorial debut. She has a co-director named uh, Dima Balin, too. And needless to say, there's a wide array of interesting people interviewed here. We get a chronological telling of Jean's career, which is essentially shown as underappreciated and out of place, maybe simply because the new waivers were breathing most of the oxygen in the room. So that means French genre cinema goers got less love. On Arrow Player, I recently saw the 1989 movie Lost in New York by Jean Roland. I thought it was a poetic movie, too easily categorized as something strange, therefore unserious. It was quite serious and hypnotic. Then in the documentary, I laughed when learning that Jean finished the Just Franco movie Zombie Lake, which is a movie with Nazi zombies in a pond being assholes. And while it doesn't get the love for most, it does for me. So this documentary is well done, and the subject is an interesting one. It was certainly a helpful lesson for me. A Jean Roland illiterate. I will do my best to seek out more of his movies in the future, thanks to Kat and Dima. Number 11. I did not see Shin Godzilla, nor have I seen any TV show or film related to Ultraman, but Shin Ultraman looked pretty hype. It was a fun ride, which will likely satisfy the kaiju people in the audience. Shinjinchi Hakuchi co-directed Shin Godzilla and is the sole director of Shin Ultraman, meaning I certainly must check out Shin Godzilla because of my satisfaction with this one. It's a point of minor frustration that I didn't go into this having seen the previous one. Anyways, um, Ultraman is a hybrid alien and human who magically appears when a kaiju threatens Japan, then upon defeating it, flies back up to the heavens, as he says, and it all gets complicated when another alien comes to Earth to tell him he has a treaty with Ultraman's alien species to conquer the planet. In that War of the Worlds logic, the human being within Ultraman gets the best of him, and while Earthlings are primitive, they need his protection. So he listens to the human being within him, ignoring his original alien self. In that sense, this movie reminds me of the story from ancient Mesopotamia called the Epic of Gilgamesh, which tells the story of a creature who is part celestial, part human. This can be found in ancient Greek texts as well. Yeah, I get it. This is a kaiju movie, but the movie parts are intelligent enough for me to be happy, and I know they aren't too particularly baff- baffling or weird to alienate the weirdos who love kaiju movies the way I do too. Number 10. The opening film of the 2022 edition of Fantasia Fest was a movie from the Yukon called Polaris, and the first fully formed opinion that I had of the movie once leaving the cinema was, what a singular movie. Sure, it's a post-apocalyptic, and it was some debt to George Miller's Road Warrior, then you could also draw some parallels to silent films, but it really felt like it was breathing the space of its own world throughout. That is a wonderful place for a genre movie to be, and certainly this is quite an intense experience with a lead being under 14 years old, uh, then murdering plenty of people throughout this 1989-minute dystopic romp. The created language of the movie makes it feel like a silent movie being done today through death grunts and a la heavy metal music, and the horns of the costumes make most of the characters look like they are in, in an Iron Maiden music video with a German expressionist angle. At first, I found it frustrating to not really understand what was being said, but the experience of this movie was tied into into an introduction to the festival in French, which I also did not understand anything outside of my interpretation. The language here makes enough sense to feel on a gut level, and I root for an original movie that dishes out violence that makes sense within the text. I have in the past said negative things about telefilm, but this movie makes me reconsider those sentiments. Number nine. The movie Country Gold is written well, acted well, shot interestingly, and lingers in your imagination days after the end credits have rolled. But that should be expected from director Mickey Reese. Mickey Reese has turned it into the North American version of Takashi Miyake, because he always has a movie playing at Fantasia Fest. I know the Japanese uh, tour has a longer record, but Mickey has delivered three gems three years in a row. I would rate it above last year's Agnes, but a notch beneath 2020's Climate of the Hunter, a hybrid a vampire melodrama movie that is highly approved of by me ever since the trailer dropped. Mickey has had a special place in my heart. With Country Gold, we see Mickey as the lead of his own movie, playing a country musician named Troyle to go on a trip to meet his country music hero, George Jones, played by Ben Hall, who is like the magic glue in all three of the Mickey movies I've seen. This movie is about happiness with an industry filled with leeches that most people would die to be in, so not appreciating the moment seems incredibly ungrateful in a way, but also understandable in the sense that it can be a headache. I guess I can't understand that part of it, since I'm not this big star but that's my reading. The poetic dialogue really worked for me, as did the black and white photography, which gave beautiful context to some very intriguing characters. Number eight. So I was of two minds in anticipation of watching the Bolson finale. The first being, I haven't seen the first two movies, so what's the point of watching this movie and being confused? Then the other position, which is, it's a movie by the Catch Me It would be quite a commitment to watch the 100 plus movies directed by that cinematic madman genius. And sure, plenty of them suck. But even as of late, some are better than others. This movie happened to be quite good. Quite good by today's standards, that is. It is totally loony. 
violent, pretty funny. It has some fun scenes that I think I'll remember for a while, like the cops doing an NWA style rap song and a character being consumed by a gi- giant manta ray. I laughed at the beginning. In the end and middle, wasn't as offensive, offensively poor as some of Mia K's movies lately. So I think this movie has a level of gritty absurdity that's completely acceptable to me, while still being quite off the same level of quality from the early 2000s. It's like a more mature Bollywood movie. So if you like over-the-top humor that you want, but you want more sexuality and aggression in both visuals as well as topics, look no further than the Molson movies, even the final one like I did. I don't think actually B.A.K. makes movies for as long as he is alive. And people in new generations are confused that this guy gets the funny that he does. I hope the future generations can enjoy his lesser movies with no prior knowledge of movies like Dead or Alive or Audition. Number seven. Accione Mutante was produced in Spain by their cinematic giant Pedro Almodovar and his directorial debut of Alex de Iglesia, whose work I was introduced to in recent years through several films release of Day of the Devil and Perita Durango. To me, Day of the Devil is one of the funniest movies of all time, and you can see the genesis of that humor in his debut, which is more ambitious goo, where there's always too much of the frame making your senses constantly overwhelmed. The story is a cyberpunk setting. A bunch of ugly mutants want to start a war against the beautiful rich people by stealing one of their women on her wedding night, and then a series of chaotic events ensue from there. The melodramatic elements of it worked on me. While I knew it <laughs> didn't work to a logical extent, the sheer chaos from the ideas and over-the-top blood-soaked emotions of a first-time director made me excited to plunge t- forward to finish watching the movie. It requires forceful attention, and your senses must be ready to be assaulted. So don't try to seek a peaceful state of mind when watching Accione Mutante, for you'll be angered to no end. So even though this movie has a lot of problems, it's hilarious approach to telling the story, it doesn't have the biggest budget for, and its youthful aggression make me tolerant of its adolescent hubris, which means you might hate it. Number six, Shasko Volume 1 is one of the great crowning achievements out of many crowning achievements for the people at Arrow Video, naturally making Shasko Volume 2 my most anticipated Blu-ray release in 2022. I got a peek of what's to come with Mercenaries from Hong Kong, which is a very funny and in its own way exciting movie from 1982, which shows off the true meaning of mercenary by pitting by the pitting of man against man in the supposed team. In that sense, it reminded me of the skinny western Kill Them All and Come Back Alone, where a guy is hired to do a job with some bounty hunters and, as the title promises, kill the rest of the team before returning to collect. In this movie, we learn that the woman who hired the team for the too good to be true prices talked to the men individually, ensuring they would all find a reason to turn against each other over love for her or for the mighty dollar. The action is always nuts, and it is very city, so it suits the tone of the nutty drama, ensuring there is never 20 minutes of boredom, while also never reaching the heights of choreography of top-tier Asian action cinema. This movie was one of my most anticipated of Fantasia Fest, and believe me, it did not disappoint. I can't wait to find out what else is in the Shawscope Volume 2 box set, but this one is going to fit in very nicely, I'm sure. Number five. Well, I got very spoiled at Fantasia Fest because I got to see John Woo introduce Hard Boiled. Then the next day I attended his master class. And the day after that, I saw him introduce Face Off, a movie which I appreciate a lot more now. The movie to me seems more like a Nicolas Cage movie than a John Woo one. How John Woo could have made him like Chow Yun Fat or Alan Delon is beyond me. John Woo seemed to me more like someone attached to this movie. It is a lot funnier than I remember. Also, the first time watching this, it did not have my engagement that the 35 millimeter print did with the Fantasia Fest crowd. So if you're slightly dismissive of this movie, like I was, you should certainly reconsider it. The action is wild. The performance is even wilder. The concept is hysterical. And it really has aged well with all these factors combined. So I feel comfortable saying this is my favorite John Woo movie he made in Hollywood. When introducing the movie, John Woo was fond in his recollection and still very grateful he got to make the movie, which is much wilder with John Travolta, but really Nicolas Cage here than anything he made before. In his masterclass, John Woo said Tom Cruise was a very smart man, and perhaps I should have saved for the Q&A about more specific details on Wild Man Nick Cage, but in the end, we can all imagine what he truly thinks on the matter. Number four. I was worked up and scared watching The Harbinger. Good grief. What an awesome experience. Because you know you are alive when, as a viewer, you are confronted with the sensations that only a good horror movie can provide. It's not tension versus jump scares. It's the incorporation of both styles that is like the Conjuring 3 sequel that we deserved. With his smaller budget movie, Andy Minton rivaling horror director James Wan here. During the q and I asked Andy if he was demon literate a term which got a laugh for the ca- from the cast, and I wanted to know what spooky, arcane text he was reading before writing the scripts, but t- to my genuine surprise, he said he isn't de- demon literate at all. 
the character of the Harbinger seemed quite detailed to me. He doesn't just kill you. He erases your life story from existence, so no one will even remember you. And the movie shows how he consumes you in your dreams, kind of like Freddy Krueger. This is way more soul-shattering of a movie than any Nightmare on Elm Street flick, though. And it has some of the best dream sequences I've seen in a while. They come a lot more from believable performances than the, the still slick special effects. As far as Fantasia flicks go, I can't ask any more than discovering a movie like The Harbinger, which I didn't have big expectations for. It just came before me, absolutely sucked me into its vortex, and will continue to live in my thoughts, I am sure. Number three. Amanda Kramer's Trip Fest flick, Give Me Pity, was my favorite new movie that played at Fantasia Fest 2022 because it reminded me of a mellow psychedelic experience that was essentially like entering or exiting a trip. That comes largely from the costumes, sets, and cameras that are there to serve as a replication of the terrible 70s TV specials for a wannabe or just barely celebrity personality to tell horrible jokes, but also to beg for attention. So... An awful lot of the responsibility for this 5 out of 5 experience is due to the lead actress Sophie Von Hasselberg in the role of Sissy St. Clair, who is faithful to the spirit of Amanda Kramer's scripts, but bent it in a twisted but great performance of someone who only desire is to be famous. The musical numbers, bits, and everything throughout this would have been fun as a one-woman stage show, perhaps, but it was really a wonderful conceptual type of cinematic experience that, for me, totally landed. The camera selection was important. It is lo-fi, but it could have been more lo-fi. But it is better served within that midpoint, so we know it is prestige art, yet still a modern movie to create a 2022 version of the 70s. It's been six years since I have tripped up, so I'm sure my enthusiastic embrace of Amanda Kramer during my interview with her was strange. But she needs to know that this movie uh, let me be my old self for its duration, which is a version of myself that is great to visit. Number two. Blue Sunshine was truly a revelatory experience. I had seen Jeff Lieberman's film just before Dawn, but basically uh, it was a hangout slash movie, and all I really remember is a guy roaming around the woods killing people with a machete. When I saw Jeff at the bar here in Montreal, I approached him to tell him that I really liked the movie, and I'm looking forward to seeing Blue Sunshine. But then while watching, I felt a little upset at one point for not being aware of such a treasure of a film. I don't even want to give a real synopsis of the film because I want you to basically experience it the way I did, which is being thrown into something wild, which eventually makes sense throughout the story. It's got a cool soundtrack, effective violence, and over-the-top acting, which I believe is totally appropriate. Uh, however, Jeff believes it should have been dialed back, and while I enjoyed it, he's the one who's been living with the movie for 45 years. I think collectors of genre movies on Blu-ray and 4K will be happy to add this one to the collection. It's age well, uh, because even though some things in it are dated, they add to the wackiness of the experience. Number one. Hard Boiled is one of those sacred cow movies to me. If someone doesn't like it, I am generally confused. How an action movie could be better constructed is beyond me, and not liking the action genre is like not liking enjoying your life. While The Killer is the ultimate experience of John Woo's filmography, this is the second best thing. It was made in a bit of a reaction to the experience. Some people accuse John Woo of making Chow Young Fat's assassin character The Killer far too cool. I mean, he is so extremely cool. But I don't see the problem. Yet, I can see how those accusations would be annoying. So here, Chow Yun Fat is a cop with a nickname of Tequila, which is also his jazz persona. We see him open the movie by playing the oboe. While his desired job in life was a musician, he's a hard-boiled cop. As the inheritor of the Jean-Pierre Melville legacy, John Wu might be playing with the notion of film as a piece of music as well. The last sound we hear in Los Samurai is someone playing two notes on a drum set. Tony Lung is almost as good as Chow Yun Fat, which is saying a lot. He would go to distinguish himself as a dramatic actor for Wong Kar Wai. But this movie has as much emotional attention brewing for us to see in bold strokes. While The Killer has more of an emotional underpinning that compels me, Hard Boiled certainly has bigger and louder set pieces that will blow new audience members away. You can see how John Woo made it big in Hollywood the year following the release of this. 